Hello, this is David Bashai. Welcome to our class on the economics of health, economics 180.289. So I'll be your instructor for the course, and this will be a short session on the basic nuts and bolts of what our topic is and how we'll go about learning economics of health together. We'll talk about uh, the course, the textbooks, about me, uh, about my expectations for the students in the class. So I want to start with first introducing the, the origins of the, the topic of health economics. Health economics was an offshoot of uh, the main field of economics in 1963 when Professor Kenneth Arrow of the University of Chicago wrote a seminal paper describing how health markets are different from markets for other goods and services in the economy. And he noted that in the healthcare area, three properties made what's going on in health dramatically different from other markets. So our three distinguishing features of health are uncertainty, asymmetric information, and externality. So it's, it's exciting to be studying a field which has different properties from the ordinary things we study in economics. The other part that's really exciting in economics is that there's a subversive element to what we're doing in economics in that the, the orthodox paradigm of economics is being forced to shift by what's going on in the healthcare field. When a scientist makes a model, they test it against uh, real-world data, and if the, the data support the model, good, but if not, that gives the, the scientists some time to develop a new model. Well, the problems that Arrow announced to the world in 1963, uncertainty and asymmetric information and externalities, break the traditional paradigm and make this area require its own special models and own special understanding. We have new problems that regular markets don't have. People's health behavior is irrational, and people don't do what ordinary uh, demanders and suppliers do. And we live in a world where the political systems that are so important to the healthcare area uh, can't actually deliver the, the optimum solution. Finally, there are markets that revolve around the healthcare area. There's markets for drugs and doctors and nurses and hospitals. Uh, but they don't actually behave that much like regular commodities markets. So by testing the limits of what you think you know about economics in the area of health, you'll become a better, better economist. We'll find together that health economics requires systems thinking. In shoe markets, we have a case where firms would sell and consumers would buy, and it's pretty straightforward, supply meets demand. In health, we have multiple complex systems that are overlapping in their scope. There's a system that pays the financing for health care. There's a system for quality assurance and many, many overlapping systems to supply the health workers and the drugs and uh, the information that's required to run the system. Innovation in health care is, is a large part of uh, the U.S. economy and the systems that produce that innovation are something that we'll talk about in the class. Uh, we have a system to produce the healthcare workforce, to try to get people through the pipeline that creates nurses and doctors and pharmacists. Finally, we do still require uh, our understanding of the household behavior because households have to demand the basic products that make them healthy and they have to decide how healthy they actually want to be. So this is a, an applied area. Health economics uh, doesn't talk about uh, mundane questions like should we buy stocks or bonds or can the Fed lower inflation or how many Toyota uh, cars can be sold in China. I think we're asking a super, super important question. What human choices will save the most lives of the most disadvantaged? So if you care about a question like that, you're in the right place in the course on health economics. Health economics requires uh, a sense that the world can actually be made better. And this is a new idea in the face of history. There, Historically, uh, there was not a belief that anything could be done about the health of populations. This is a picture from the Decameron by Boccaccio. And Boccaccio described a group of people who lived in 
medieval Italy in the 1300s, and they felt that no matter where they happened to be, uh, they would get the plague. Uh, it was as though they imagined that the wrath of God would not unleash this plague against men for their iniquities, irrespective of where they happen to be, and so they they give up. They say there's nothing we can do except tell ourselves some stories. And the rest of the book just is premised on the idea that there's nothing that can be done. Well, here today, uh, there's something that can be done about the health of populations. And when we see different countries make different success against their epidemics, uh, we know that our policy choices matter and we want to be better at it. Uh, the next idea is that in what makes populations healthier, I will help deliver you all from the delusions of the bench scientists. Here's a, a picture of a bench scientist named Aerosmith, and he's looking uh, at his lab, asking himself, if only I could find a cure. Uh, and finding cures uh, is kind of neat, and it's wonderful, and no one is opposed to it, but the market that delivers them has tremendous flaws. I'll give you the example of measles vaccine. Here is a vaccine that was invented in 1963. It is extremely inexpensive. It costs 21 cents a dose. And yet now, more than 50, almost 60 years after the invention of measles vaccine, we cannot deliver it uh, to all the children in the world. And still today, 200,000 children die of measles every year. So if you are about to invent a new vaccine or you think one is, is coming in your hand in the, the next few months, um, don't get so excited. The economic problem of delivery uh, is so great that the, the final delivery of, of any brand new product in healthcare may take half a century or more to reach everybody who can benefit from it. So this course will cover the basics of demand and supply in the health sector to make you a good health economist. Uh, you will encounter and take apart economic models, uh, and that'll make you better not just at being an economist, but at being a good citizen. We'll encounter models in our textbooks. Uh, we will uh, discuss them in class. We'll have group discussion uh, about what we're learning together to see how we can apply it. Now, we'll go over the syllabus uh, when we meet uh, in, uh, in our uh, first uh, interactive session. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to, to get you the idea that you'll be looking at models of how the healthcare system works. Now, we are sensitive to the fact that uh, the health economy is happening uh, in a political space, and I promise to be sensitive to that space, and I want you to feel safe regardless of your political spectrum, that I will not be teaching you what to think. I want you to be critical uh, in applying economics to policy uh, choices in healthcare, care. Uh, and I want you to learn how to apply what we're doing uh, with a, as much skill uh, and economic know-how as I can impart to you. We have a textbook. Uh, textbook is uh, Rice and Unruh. Uh, there's the, the fourth edition, which is uh, available uh, on um, uh, Amazon or from the, the Matthews Bookstore. And, uh, the third edition's also okay. If you get a way better deal on the third edition, you'll be okay. Uh, I think the fourth edition uh, is is probably uh, my preference, so go for the fourth edition if you can swing it. Uh, Rice and Unra as textbook authors uh, are very helpful in uh, explaining why they believe the government should be involved extensively in the health sector, and they are not knee-jerking on this. They're not saying, well, we're liberals, we think the government should do everything. They're going to give us an argument to assess and be very careful about. And I want us to be critical about the Rice and Unruh uh, case that government should be extensively involved in many aspects of the healthcare market. So I'll give you an, a chance to see those arguments rather than just simply accept that, oh, yeah, uh, government should get involved. So. Uh, that's the textbook. We'll have a chance to talk about it when we interact. Uh, about me. So <clears throat> uh, I went to school uh, at Harvard. I got my bachelor's in the philosophy and physics uh, joint major. I think I was the first one ever to combine both fields in a, a double major. Uh, I got my medical degree at the University of California, San Diego, immediately after college. 
uh, got an MPH, which is a public health degree at UCLA, uh, while I was in med school in the Department of Population and Family Health. Right after uh, uh, my MD, I went on for residency at the UCLA Cedar sinai uh, Medical Center. Here's a picture of me as a resident uh, helping a, a newborn baby. Uh, um, I'm actually sucking poop out of it, uh, that baby's mouth so that it doesn't uh, choke and get, a, get pneumonia. Uh, right after residency, went on to Wharton Business School and got a PhD in health economics. And uh, after that came to Johns Hopkins in 1996. I've been on the faculty ever since, uh, rising from assistant to full professor. Um, let me tell you why I became a health economist. I wanted to become a health economist way back in college, back in 1982. I was sitting in a biology class, and the instructor, a uh, famous biologist by the name of E.O. Wilson, showed us this slide of population growth and showed that, uh, you know, what was happening for me in 1982, right about there, was incredibly dramatic, that the population um, explosion of the world was dramatically different. Um, I saw this as an important issue driven by both health technology and by distribution. I thought that what would really make a difference back in 1982 was uh, both better contraception and the ability to distribute contraception. So back in the 80s, uh, this was our uh, global climate change crisis. Where was a, there was a population bomb going on, and I wanted to be able to address that crisis with both all of the skills of a physician, so I went to medical school, and all of the skills of an economist, so I went to uh, get a degree in economics. I really uh, value my background, and as I said, I you know, sort of gotten a lot of exposure to both economics and uh, philosophy. Uh, my teachers are on this slide. Professor John Rawls was a, a very influential philosopher of the 20th century who was was my instructor for a political philosophy class uh, while I was at Harvard. And his readings will come into our class because we all will be concerned with social justice and equity. Professor Mark Pauley, uh, still uh, on the faculty at University of Penn at the Wharton School, uh, a very important uh, economist whose theories of uh, the moral hazard uh, still dominate the field today, and I'll be able to share with you his uh, writings on moral hazard. Professor Patricia Danzen uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, very important in the economics of pharmaceuticals and the economics of malpractice. So I'll be able to, to share what I, I learned from my own professors. As far as my own research, I uh, have focused a lot of my uh, professional attention studying household health decision making. I study data that comes from uh, low and middle income country households on how parents and grandparents and fathers and teenagers decide what to do to their bodies and their children's bodies to stay healthy. Uh, so when we come to describing what creates health, I'll bring that, that skill in. I've also spent a lot of time discussing models of public health, and I'll be sharing with you what the field of public health is, what its practice constitutes, and how it is practiced in the realm of health departments, vaccines, nutrient supplementation, safety counseling, and the quality of the healthcare field. So for those of you who are public health majors, uh, I can help uh, with what it is to, to practice public health. So this course will cover the basics of demand and supply in the health sector, uh, and I think uh, you'll get a lot out of it. The students' roles in the class. I want you to watch lectures uh, and take notes during lectures. Uh, there will be, uh, for these recorded lectures, uh, there will be captions and uh, stream, streaming text that could help you if, if you um, miss something you can go back to the, to the captions. In each of my uh, uh, lectures, I will be hiding uh, little Easter eggs in the PowerPoints under the notes section, and I'll give you little stars that tell you when there's an Easter egg sitting down in the notes section. When we do have an interactive session, I want you to come. I want you to participate. Um, when we have discussions on Piazza, I want you to participate in the, the discussions on, uh, on our discussion zone. 
please ask questions all on Piazza. Don't uh, email us if unless it's something that only concerns you. But if it's about the course content, I bet it's going to matter to another student. And in that case, let's conduct that on Piazza. Uh, we will have a midterm uh, and a final, and those will be discussed when we gather interactively. Uh, the assignments will be due on their due date. Uh, unexcused uh, late assignments will be deducted by 10% per day. And if you just write to us um, on email, there'll be excuses for something that, that comes up and something always comes up. So don't, don't worry about that. So again, welcome to the class. I'm thrilled to have you here. And even though we're meeting partially um, remotely like this, uh, I think we'll have uh, an excellent time interacting with each other to go over this really important material. Uh, this has become probably the most important subject in the world now with the coronavirus epidemic, and it is so relevant. Uh, what we do covers how governments and people and you can help uh, use rational choice to control uh, one of the greatest public health problems of, of the last hundred years. So we're going to have a uh, an important and exceptionally relevant year together, and I look forward to meeting you uh, at our next interactive session. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,